name is Ryan Michael. I work on this project called Cascada. Um, we like to say that it is real-time generative AI without the fuss. So um, what I want to show you guys today is a demo that we built. But before we get to that, um, I want to talk a little bit about what I think is super interesting about what's happening in this field right now. Um, I've seen a lot of really cool demos about what you can do with question answering and chatbots and all kinds of stuff like that, what you can do with RAG. Uh, I'm sure we'll hear some more about that later today. But what is really interesting to me, somebody just asked me this question about where generative AI can go, I think, is that we've finally gotten to the point where models are able to understand what's happening in the world in real time in a really rich way and use that information to take actions, to act on our behalf. Excuse me? Oh, is it? OK, here we go. Yeah. And actually take actions on our behalf that optimize some outcome that we care about. They can do things that we don't have to be involved in, and they can do this at scale. And I think that the core to this is this first word in there is real time, is being able to perceive and act in real time so you can leverage that kind of capacity in the moment. So this example I want to show you is uh, something we call Beep GPT. Um, so what this is an app that watches what's happening in your Slack workspace. It's built a really deep understanding of your entire organization, what people are good at, what people are interested at, what you're responsible for. And it watches all the conversations that are happening. When it sees something that it thinks you are going to care about and you haven't engaged with it, it beeps and says, hey, you should come watch this. Check out this conversation that's happening, right? So the idea here is that it lets you not focus on Slack and turn off your notifications. So this would have been, whoa, really difficult to build not too long ago. And now I kicked it, and it's not working. This is going to be the talk of technical difficulties. Boop -a -doop -a -doop -a -doop -a -doop. Ah, there we go. All right. I will try to not kick the cord again. Um, this would have been really difficult to build two years ago, probably. And there's a couple of things that have changed since then that I think are really game changers that I want to kind of highlight before we get into the implementation. The first is these foundation models that I'm sure we've all heard about. The reason that these are important is that they mean that you don't have to have all of the world's data crawled and sitting on a web page. You don't have to have hundreds of thousand dollars worth of GPU capacity. You can bring a small data set and build a really impressive model. The second is that there's all kinds of AI as a service applications now. We can go to OpenAI, we can go to Google, we can go to all sorts of places now and not have to manage infrastructure, not have to be experts in training and fine tuning and hyperparameter search. We can just give it our data and get a model that works. And the final thing, these have been around for a while, but I want to call these out because there's a lot of really interesting real time APIs that allow you to get access to data without doing a bunch of infrastructure setup. You don't have to set up a whole bunch of, you know, services and Kafka connectors and all this kind of stuff. In many cases, you can just make an API call and get data and start, start moving. So let me talk through the kind of process of what we're going to look at here. Um, at a high level, we're going to take our Slack historical data, we're going to do some magic, and we're going to build some historical prompts. This will be our training data set that we'll use to fine tune our model. We'll send all of these prompts to OpenAI, and that will generate a custom LLM that knows all about our Slack users and our Slack workspace and what we care about in our internal jargon. We're going to then hit that same Slack endpoint, except in a real-time way, and we're going to get another magic application to produce um, real-time prompts. So this would be basically saying, what's happening right now? Construct that same prompt, pass it through that model, and then deliver a notification if it's appropriate. So the question here is, how are we going to do these two things with the magic balls, right? We need to be able to do something to actually analyze that historical data and then re react in real time. And that's where the tool that I work on, Cascada, comes in. Cascada gives you the ability to do both of those things using the exact same queries, the same infrastructure, the same coding paradigms, and to share your work between both of these contexts. It's also super performant, easy to use, all that good stuff. So let's, let's see if we can get to a demo. Uh, I'm realizing that my tabs are hidden because the screen is very large. So let's see if I can actually find it. Oh my god. Where's my mouse? I'm going to just guess that it's right here. OK, so 
This is the repo. This is public, open source. If you want to go check this out, you can run it. You can train this on your own Slack workspace. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to run through some of the code that's in here um, as soon as I find my mouse. So the first thing we're going to look at is this fine-tuning notebook. So this is how we build the data set that we're going to use to train on. This is the first leg of that process diagram. We can skip through some of this stuff. This is just set up. Boop, 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 boop. Combining files. So here's where we actually start. So what we're doing here is we're pulling in all of the messages that we downloaded from the Slack historical API. So this is the first step that we were talking about. Slack makes it really easy to get all of your history. It's just a big parquet file. It's got everything that you've ever done in there. You can see the structure of this data. What this is giving you is the individual events. So somebody posted an old message one text. Somebody posted an update in some other channel. These are happening at different points in time. And Cascada is an event-based event processing or an event-based data processing engine. And so the first thing you have to do when you load this data is tell it what time each of the columns are. From here, we can start to actually build the examples. What we want to do here is we want to teach our model what does it mean for someone to care about a conversation? Who cares? Why do they care? And we need to extract that signal from somewhere. We don't want to tell it. We want to pull it out of the data. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to build a set of examples that capture engagement in some, sort of, some form or another. But before we can do that, we have to pull the messages out. Because if we just process them as they come, they're coming in chronologically, which means they're all going to be garbled. Um, if you ever looked at like the fire hose of Twitter or Blue Sky or something, you'll see this happening in real time. It's really hard to tell what's going on. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to just break them out and have each message be grouped by the channel it was posted in. And if there's a thread, a thread is like a side conversation, um, we'll group on that as well. Now we've got everything pulled out. The state of a conversation isn't a single event, though. Like, somebody posting something is not enough context. We need to be able to have a window. If you think of what you see in the Slack UI, you're seeing a window over the most recent events that have come in. And what we do here is we construct that same sliding window over all of the events that have happened in a thread. So we basically just say, collect up the most 20 most recent. What this gives us is a sliding window that gives you the state of the conversations that they've happened at every point in time. Basically, every possible window is produced from this query. And that's a start. That's what we can feed to the model. But for us to actually observe engagement, we need to give people time. They need to be able to actually read the conversation and react to it. So there's a time shift between a particular state of a conversation and whether or not that's interesting to a particular person. And so the first thing we're going to do here is we're going to shift that conversation forward in time so that we can combine it with the set of users that engaged with it. That's where the shift comes in. So this is a shift operation that basically moves everything forward in time. And now that we've moved the conversations forward in time, we can compute who cares about that conversation. We're going to do this in two different ways. The first thing we're going to look at is who reacted. Like, did you post a like, plus one emoji? Uh, did you do some other sort of um, Slack reaction activity? We're going to just collect up over the same kind of five minutes that we moved forward the people who engaged with the conversation. And then we're going to flatten them and, and build a list out of it. So that's our first criteria. We're going to say, if you engaged with this conversation, you might want to have known about it if you didn't know about it or otherwise. The second thing we're going to look at here is who's participating in the conversation, who actually responded, who posted. This is a little bit easier. We'll just pull out the user field and then, again, collect this up over a different type of window. So we've seen now a couple of different ways of aggregating. Um, and this is something that Cascada does a lot of work for, different ways of kind of describing window operations. Um, in this first example here, we just said take kind of 20 maximum subsequent, like in a, in a line, basically. This is saying, give me the most recent five minutes. We do sliding windows, a bunch of other different types of windows. So at this point, we've figured out what the state of a conversation is. We've moved it forward in time. We've observed what's happened in the time that we moved it over, and we need to combine those. That is a way that we can basically associate those together. And we can do that by just sticking them together. We'll just build a record that has both of those. Um, so what we've done here is we've built these training examples. Now what we've got is a history of how the conversation unfolded, and the particular users that engaged with it in various ways in the five minutes following that state of the conversation. So this is our training data set. This encodes all of the information that the model can learn about who cares about what and who interacts with our, our organization and in what way. So we're ready to train. 
from here on out, what we're looking at is gonna be specific to the OpenAI API. Um, this is where we start looking at how we can massage this and format it in a way that OpenAI's particular models are gonna be happy with. So the first thing that we need to do is concatenate all of the messages, right? So we collected a bunch of messages. We're gonna just concatenate them, put new lines in between, and then we're gonna add this closing delimiter. Um, this tells the model that we're done giving it the input and we're ready for it to give us a response. Um, this is not something that we provide in Cascada natively, but it's all Python, so we can just like pass in a UDF. Um, this is useful for a bunch of different things. You can use this for applying pre-processing, embedding models, you can use this for training if you want to. Basically, you have the full power of Python within this kind of pipeline that we're building that Cascada gives you, um, and it's pretty easy to write these UDFs. Second step is we need to actually format the labels. So what we're gonna do is sort of abuse the OpenAI API. What we're gonna do is we're gonna ask for one token and the log probabilities of five different versions of that token. And we're gonna treat that token as a prediction of who is interested in the conversation. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna train the model to predict the one person that replied next. We'll do that by basically just picking one at random, right? So if we have multiple people who engage with the conversation, we'll just pick one. And you know, over time, the model will learn like who is and is not interested. The other thing we're gonna do is we're going to map user IDs, which are big long strings in Slack, down to integers so that they end up being a single token. Obviously this doesn't work for huge data set sizes, but it works for a pretty large number of users and it works for this example. Um, and that's what's happening here is we're just uh, picking one if there's multiple and then mapping it down to an integer and then <clears throat> building our examples here. So in this case, what we've done is we've pulled the conversation that we built previously, formatted it for the model, and then we've taken the um, users that we discovered that were interested in the conversation and formatted them as completions. And you can see here, we've got messages, they're joined by new lines, they've got the delimiter at the end, our completion you know, is now strings. We put nil in there if nobody is interested. Um, and then we put a, an end terminator to let the model know this is the end of, of the input. So these are all based on OpenAI's recommendations for how you use their API. Different um, APIs may have different constraints or different suggestions. Um, a lot of this is kind of black magic and you know trial and error. Now that we've described our training set, we basically just convert it to pandas and write it to a file. This isn't super interesting up here. Um, we'll do the same with our labels so we can use them again later. Um, and this is the extent of the fine tuning process, right? So like, this has become so easy that it's just not worth worrying about in a lot of ways. Uh, they've got, um, OpenAI has some very nice tooling around like in this case where we're uploading the file and we're preparing it. Um, I'm not gonna show this here, but it has some really nice heuristics that applies to all of your data. It looks for things like duplicates or things that are too long or too short um, and really guides you towards having a successful experience. And then this is the downside, is that this create the training job thing probably take about 12 hours to complete. Um, and it's primarily waiting in line. So sometimes you'll find that you can get into the, into the queue and get to an actual trained model more quickly, but oftentimes there's a lot of waiting involved. Cycle time is not the best. Um, this would be a benefit of using something like Hugging Face with a, you know, if you have it, a fleet of A100s or something. But this is the extent of it. At this point, we've gone through our data, we've prepared all of our features, and we've fine-tuned a model and we're done, and I don't know how many lines of code this was, but it was not very many. Um, this would have taken a lot longer if you were bootstrapping this from, from scratch, as you can imagine. So this was the first kind of phase of what we wanted to do. Um, the second phase, let me see if I can get my browser to actually show up properly. No, it's gonna get more complicated, of course. All right, phase two, we wanna use it in production. So this is the part where you stop what you're working, you go hire a bunch of infrastructure engineers, you hand off your notebook, and you re-implement everything from scratch and build a giant coffee cluster, right? No, <laughs> this is the part where you just keep working and it's all ready to go in you know, another 20 or 30 minutes. Um, so what we're gonna see here is a simplified implementation. Obviously there's a lot of you know, things that you would want to do in a production application that I'm not gonna show here, but um, the, the point here is just to kind of see how you can get started really quickly. Um, 
we're going to create the connection to OpenAI. We're going to authenticate our Slack. So not so much interesting there. So this is where we're starting to tell Cascada about our live data source. So this should look familiar. In structure, it's very similar to the Parquet data source that we loaded previously. The big difference is that we're not giving it any data. We're telling it the structure of the data, but there's no actual data in there. And that's because the data is going to arrive in real time as the process is running. So we've created this object, this like handle, so that we can add data. Next thing we need to do is actually get some data, right? So Slack has two APIs you can use to get history. One is the historical one, which we looked at just a second ago. The second is the socket mode client. So what this does is this sets up a web socket connection to um, Slack. Anytime anything happens in your Slack workspace, you'll get notified within a couple of seconds, probably less many times. So what we've done here is we've just defined a handler. We've said, uh, I'm going to acknowledge the, the um, request that I got back. I'm going to extract the payload. I'm going to do a little bit of you know, converting of various data types. This is the money part right here. We're going to add this to Cascada as a dynamically added row to the data set that we're doing a computation over. Uh, this is just setting up the thing. So what we've done is we've basically grown the set of events that Cascada is computing over each time there's a new event coming in. But we're using the exact same, as we'll see, um, description of how to do that operation. And so here's where we're going to handle the, um, the actual conversation. So this is a little bit longer. Um, this should look familiar, right? The, the key here is that you don't want to re-implement all of your work, because if you make subtle changes in how your features are being computed, you end up with serving training skew, which can be a real nightmare to try to diagnose. So by reusing all of this work, you don't have to worry about that. This is the exact same definition that we used previously to build a, previously to build a conversation, so we're going to reuse it here. We're going to use this same prompt formatting that we saw previously. The only thing we're going to change here is that we're going to add a little bit of extra metadata whoa, in here. That's what happens when you do it sideways. We're going to add a little bit of metadata here that makes it easier to build a response that we send to the user. So this is basically just some information about the state of the conversation that we're going to use to say, hey, this message just happened. You should take a look at it. This is the other big difference to what we saw previously. So previously, we built up that uh, kind of pipeline of operations, and we converted it to a pandas data frame, and we went to town on it. In this case, what we're doing is we're calling run iter. And what that does is it sets a persistent process up that generates an asynchronous generator and yields rows as they're computed. So every time we add a new row or set of rows, some number of results are going to come out the other end of this generator, and we can handle it dynamically. This is all asynchronous, so it will happen roughly at the same time. Um, the end-to-end -end latency of the actual compute engine is like microseconds. Um, once we get these rows, we're ready to use our model. So this is, again, a very simple call. We don't have to provision any infrastructure. We're going to just call make a creation, or a completion, rather, pass it the model that we trained previously. This is the weird stuff, right? So what we're saying is, I want one token back, but give me five log probs. So what this is going to do is it's going to say, I'm going to select the five most likely next tokens, and I'm going to give them all to you with log probabilities of them being the next token. We're going to treat that as a threshold. If it's 80% likely that some user would be the next person to engage, we're going to tell them if they don't. If nobody cares, then we're not going to do anything. Right? So if it's just like random choice and it's all like 0% that somebody's going to respond, uh, we'll just ignore it. You could do this if you were building like a hugging face model without having to hack the API, um, but this is kind of what we have for here. Um, the rest of this is just kind of like boilerplate. So we've got the user label, interested users. We're going to pull out, you know, apply this threshold, and we're going to like send a message back to the user, and uh, everyone's going to be happy. So um, there we are, and now for the actual demo, which I promised. Let's see if I can actually find where it is. No. <laughs> Eventually, I'm going to grab the browser that has the stuff in it. There we go. OK. So here's Slack. And oh my god, I'm never doing this again. This was a mistake. Uh, I'm going to close all of these windows. 
There's a terminal under here somewhere. I have to find it. Oops, boop, she boop. Oh, there's not. Well, that explains some things. Where is the terminal? There it is. Ah. Okay. So here's our beep GPT script. I ran it. I canceled it earlier. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna just kind of like see if this thing works, right? So let's give it some uh, some messages. So like, hold on. Okay, so I'm hoping that that will not be very interesting to anybody. Um, let's find out. Okay, cool. So we got the message back in real time. We sent it to the model. We got back a bunch of log probabilities. So this first one here where it says interest for nil, which is the nobody cares, is 100%. Um, it's truncated, so it's probably slightly smaller. Um, but the model has determined that this is not worth alerting anybody around. Um, and then just to kind of make the demo complete, we will put in, ah, we will cheat and put in this piece of text, which I happen to know will make the model work, just because I don't want to try to do that in real time. You saw behind the curtain, congratulations. Um, and then we will go and we will see, oh, look, there we go. Interest for user one, who happens to be me, is 50.65%. I got a notification, and here it is. You may be interested in this conversation. You should come check it out. Um, so, is this a fabricated example? Yes. Um, is it still cool? I think so. Um, so, let's see if I can get back to my actual presentation. Probably not, because I just closed it. So, we'll just leave it at this, because I only have like one more slide to cover up anyway. Um, so, I think what I wanted to do kind of to close out is just kind of like step back for a minute and kind of talk about what I think is interesting here and what we just kind of saw in a sense. Um, like I said to begin with, I think the opportunity for these models is, is a lot larger than just answering questions in a lot of ways. I think that what these models can do is perceive the world and act on that perception. And we can train them how to act in a lot of different ways. We can do it through retrieval augmentation, we can do it through prompting, we can do it through interactive agent descriptions, and we can also do it through fine tuning. I think the core functionality that is necessary for making this work and to be really, really powerful is to be able to handle that information as it happens. Because oftentimes the things that we care about, if we react to them two days later or a day later or whatever, the opportunity is gone. Someone else has already taken advantage of it. And I think there's a whole lot of really interesting applications um, that are based on this. So I would love if I could put the link to our Slack up here. But of course, nothing is working, so I will not. But I will just put this up. This is our web page. If you're interested in hearing about this, I would love to talk with you. Uh, there's a link up here with Slack. If you follow that, you will join our Slack. Um, our GitHub is also available if you want to go try out BeepGPT, train it on your own data, see if it works better uh, and you don't have to fake it. Uh, please give it a try. Um, the training is not very difficult or expensive, um, and I'd be interested in hearing if it works for you. Um, and then finally, if you are working on real-time AI applications, um, and it looks like Cascada could be useful for you, give it a try. Let me know if you're interested. I'd be happy to sit down and talk with you about use cases. We've been working with a lot of companies to kind of help them build out their stacks. Um, might be able to share some tips, um, maybe learn a little bit. So I think that's all I've got. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. And if anyone has any questions, Ryan is here. Um, the, he can have like, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, questions. questions. That's a good idea. Could you speak in the mic? Uh, sorry, it's just something. I guess your cascade, your cascade is trained on historical data. Mm -hmm. If I would add a few more new channels that were not in your historical data, do we have to fine tune again? Or somehow all these new channels that could be diverse topics? Yeah, will... so I mean, that's one of the down tunes of fine tuning, especially in a real time world, is that you kind of, uh, as the information that you need to incorporate in your model grows, you need to keep fine tuning on it. Okay. Um, so you can fine tune from fine tunes. So, like, this is possible, obviously. You know, there gets to be complexity there around things like catastrophic forgetting with online training. 
Um, and there are you know, ways that you can use things like retrieval augmentation to provide other sources of information instead of just training. Um, but yeah, that, that is one of the things that, that you would need to think more about in a long-term scenario. So. And you need to send your data to open AI for the training. So I guess the data is not being kept in your own premises, but you have to provide it to open AI. I mean, your, yeah. Your training data. yeah, to yeah. train the model, you have to transfer all of your data. Okay. Okay. Um, Thanks. So, you know, there, there could be privacy or kind of like data governance issues with that, but the API is very easy to use. They make it very easy for you to give them their data. So. Um, oh, you mean if you want to like script in JS? We have thought, so like the engine itself is built in Rust. Um, so we provide like FFI bindings into Python and so it's like super snappy. We've looked at be basically doing a Wasm compilation. We haven't done that, but if you have an application, I'd be happy to talk with you about whether that's something that would be worth giving it a try. Um, I think it's doable, we just, it's not something we prioritized yet, so. To less important as time goes by. So, is there any plan to evaluate um, how long the history will it make sense for the model to bestly perform? Yeah. So, the question, if I understand, is kind of can we handle rolling windows of if historical data? Yeah. So, that's we saw that right there. So, you know, one of the things that we're doing is that we're treating data as sort of a timeline, right? So, we get a bunch of events, all those events have times associated with them. When we do something like collect 10, what we're saying is I want you to take a window over time and move it forward and collect 10 as you go. And each one of those 10 will generate a new value and create a new timeline at each point containing the like 10 most recent basically. And so you can configure that however you want. It could be the most recent 10. It could be like the most recent 10 minutes. It could be all of the events since the last time something that I care about happened. There's all kinds of windowing that you can do. Um, or it could be since the beginning of the day or each day or whatever. Um, and that's one of the things that we originally spent a lot of time working on is kind of how do we window in really interesting ways um, because that can be really hard to do. I don't know if you've tried to do this with like windowed aggregations in SQL or something like that. Like it can be really tricky. You kind of have to do it. Every aggregation you do, you have to give it the same window and make sure you're handling time the right way. It can be tricky. So. Mm -hmm. Cascada. What does the Cascada improve upon or you know, replace? Today? So I think it kind of depends on who we're talking about. I think in a lot of cases, it would be just a bunch of like spaghetti code, right? So I'm gonna just like build all this by hand in Python or whatever. Um, I think that's one kind of use case. I think the other use case, especially at larger organizations, is there might be separate teams involved. You might have a team that's a data science team that's working in pandas and they're doing data analysis or they're using some of the kind of um, notebook-based analysis. And then oftentimes when they find a model, what they'll do is they'll hand it off to another team and they'll start from scratch and rebuild it on top of like Flink or Spark Streaming or some other tool or just hand roll it in Java or something. Um, and then deploy that on an entirely separate infrastructure and there's a, oftentimes a lot of information lost in that transition. And even if there's not, it can often take, like it's not unusual for these models to take eight or 12 months to get into production just because of the coordination. Um, so I think what our kind of like Goal right now is to focus more on people that are just trying, that have an idea, and they want to try something out and get started quickly, right? Like, I think what we're looking at is unblocking people that want to build something that hasn't been built before. And what we see is that a lot of the really innovative work in the generative AI space is not coming from IBM, right? Like, I don't know, not to speak ill of IBM if anyone works there, but like, it's coming from like, people on the ground in twos and threes that have ideas and they're trying shit out. And that's kind of what we're trying to facilitate. So. Awesome, so we have one more question and oh, then, sure. yeah. Apologies if I missed this from the beginning of your uh, conversation, but how sensitive did you find the fine tuning process to your data formatting? Were you mixing and matching formatting? Was it consistent the whole way through and that worked? Or I'm just curious. So um, the fine tuning is definitely a longer process than what I kind of hinted at here. Um, I think what we found is that data quality is really, really important. In fact, I'll probably do a separate talk just about data quality. Um, but some of the TLDRs there is basically, one thing to recognize is that your model is gonna learn on the easiest thing to learn on. So in an earlier version of this, we trained a model 
that inadvertently was almost entirely based on user IDs. It had built a basically a social map of like who talks to who. And then when we took the model we built on one Slack workspace and tried to move it to another Slack workspace, it was just trash because all the IDs had changed. And it hadn't actually learned anything about what was happening in the conversation. It was just like, oh, Ryan always responds when you know Chris, Chris posts or whatever. So you need to be careful about what you're teaching it because it's going to take the path of least resistance. In terms of formatting, it wasn't super important, honestly. The biggest change that we made or the biggest thing that we um, tweaked that was really important was reversing the order of the messages in the history. So I think what's happening here is that recent messages are more relevant and the models tend to pay more attention to things that are near the end of the prompt. Because again, like they're getting text in that order as well. And so reversing the message order was like, it increased our F1 score by like 20% or something like that. It was very impactful. Everything else that we did really didn't matter much at all. Like we did some experiments with stripping out special characters, stripping out links, stripping out code, doing all kinds of stuff like that. I mean like it would move the score up like a point or two, but like, you know, random variation. So it's hard to say for sure. Um, but by and large, I think the bigger question is about structuring the problem correctly, more so than the details of like what characters you use here or there. Um, so. Awesome, thank you so much, for, Ryan. Thank you for all the questions. Thank you. All right, ready for the next talk. Next up, we have Val Kulichenko from Datastax. And um, he will be talking about AstraDB and JSON API. Over to you, uh, Val. One, two. All right, hey all. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks for the great demo. Um, by the way, I hope you enjoyed the demo because the demo I was planning for stopped working half an hour ago. So I will have to improvise. Anyway, so uh, my name is Val. I'm with uh, Datastax, uh, part of the product management team working on like the core database side of, side of things. Uh, I'm gonna talk about what we did for AstroDB in terms of like developer experience and uh, how we'll basically tell you a story how we approach this and what we learned from that um, and before i go there just a couple of words about the AstroDB itself this is our main product that we're that i'm working on uh, this is basically just a managed database as a service uh, which runs in a cloud environment and based on apache cassandra so it's a very scalable database, has been out there for many years, durable, scalable, uh, great database overall. But uh, so far, it's, it was like the, the, the AstroDB as a product was very focused on um, allowing existing Cassandra users to switch to cloud environment and to like managed environment uh, for just easier deployment. And uh, if you look at this diagram right here, we have like a bunch of APIs and drivers uh, on, top of the, on top of the Cassandra, which AstroDB provides, but all of them are very like Cassandra oriented. For Cassandra CQL, C Cassandra Query Language is the main API. And all those APIs, they expose a lot of those, as we call them, Cassandraisms, which was working for us uh, for quite a bit of time. But recently, with the, uh, with the rise of the AI applications, we started noticing that we have this challenge that people are coming to AstroDB and they don't really want to use CQL. There is a learning curve, curve associated with it. It takes some time to learn it. And also why, right? So we started looking into this and uh, we have a bunch of ideas out there, but uh, <laughs> the first, as a first step, we basically decided to uh, create the uh, create a JSON API for AstroDB. And uh, the reason we picked that as our first step is just we want to essentially appeal to JavaScript community, to JavaScript developers, which is the lar largest developer community. 
And uh, this is how Java developers see the data. They, they, they usually work with data as with JSON documents. So that was like our reasoning, and that's what we went with. And essentially what this API does, in a nutshell, is it converts AstroDB to a document database. So instead of working with it through CQL or CQL-like APIs, you just view it as a regular document database and you insert JSON documents, retrieve JSON documents, so that's creates this natural alignment with the, with the whole JavaScript ecosystem. You don't need to do data modeling. This is another big challenge. If you ever try to work with Cassandra or with Astra, uh, you had to do a lot of data modeling, create the tables, figure out what the indexes should be, all that stuff. No need for that with the new JSON API. So the, 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 the main goal here is basically just one, <laughs> is to let JavaScript developers to start coding in no time. Uh, fire up a database in the cloud and start, start coding, creating the applications. So here are the, some basic examples um, of the APIs. That It's a very typical document-based API. You can create collections. You can insert documents. You can do some filtering. Uh, you can do find and update in a single query. Uh, we utilize what we call lightweight transactions for that. This is actually a very interesting uh, thing that we had to deal with. Uh, this lightweight transactions mechanism that Cassandra has is somewhat limited in terms of speed and scalability, uh, but Cassandra 5 is going to have uh, what we call a court protocol, which is going to make it much faster. So if this is something you're looking for um, in the future, it's going to improve significantly. So those like basic, and basic operations are great, and just exposing AstroDB as a document database uh, is already awesome, but we wanted to take it a little bit further than that. And uh, what we noticed when like, talking to, 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 to users of AstroDB and to JavaScript developers in general is that uh, more often than not, they, they, they view data, they, they work with data and with document databases specifically, uh, not directly, but rather through ODM frameworks, and specifically MongooseJS, which is essentially like a de facto standard uh, for these kind of things. Uh, and this is essentially how many JavaScript developers think about the data. And uh, we actually worked with MongooseJS community directly, and uh, with uh, one of the creators of MongooseJS, to, to, to create the API, which is not just a document API, but it's also completely compatible with MongoosJS library. Uh, what that means is that not only you don't have to learn CQL, you don't need to learn any new API. There is this very popular library out there, which is, it has like two million downloads on NPM every week or something like that. So it's very popular. Uh, it's all over Stack Overflow and everything. Um, and all you need to do to work with Astra through this library is to do this like couple of lines of code. So um, there is this uh, driver, which is like a thin layer between the Mongoose itself and our API. So it does some translations there and uh, some other minor things. You tell Mongoose to, to use that driver and then you can connect to AstraDB. So it's a very streamlined experience from developer perspective, and that's exactly what we're looking for. And that is basically why we uh, decided to go, to go with this route. So now, I mentioned initially that this all started with uh, us having more and more users coming with AI use cases. And like, AI use cases obviously, you know, like our nowadays, um, speed is very important. There is no place for like learning new technologies, learning new APIs. Uh, so we're providing this JSON API with Mongo support. But for AI applications, we also wanted to expose the vector search support that 
Cassandra already provides and AstroDB already provides. So this is what we did on top of Mongoose. We essentially kind of, uh, if, if you look at this, this is like a very typical schema in Mongoose, except for two things, right? There is this uh, dollar vector field, which is like a special field to, to store vector embeddings. And you can also like specify what the size of the vector is and what is the similarity function. There are several options out there that uh, both Cassandra and AstroDB provides, and you can use any of those through through the API using this uh, using this basic setting. So, and again, some code examples. So again, this is like the way, so the way we look at this is we want to create a product that a JavaScript developer can pick up, fire up a database, and start creating AI applications, right? So the, the, the way the vector search is exposed is as simple as any other basic operations, right? So you can insert an object, and within that object, you can have a, a value for this dollar vector field, and that would be your uh, embedding for whatever you want to have there. In this case, we're just generating embedding for the uh, description that we have. You can do basic vector search. That's the second example I have here. Uh, what it would do is would just, again, take the embedding, generate the embedding for the whatever string you want to provide. It doesn't have to be string, it can, can be an image as well or whatever you want to uh, index for. And it will find the most relevant documents based on that embedding that you have in the database. And you can also limit the, the number of documents that you want to retrieve. So if it says limit three, you get three documents. If it says limit five, you get five documents and so on. You can also do hybrid searches as well. So you can do like all the basic CRUD operations and like basic searches based on the uh, regular attributes like title, year, genre, or whatnot. You can do vector search individually, and you can combine those two as well, right? So if you uh, if you build your application around uh, this vector embedding with some metadata around it, right? So you can do that as well. You can, in this particular case, if we're uh, filtering out and looking for uh, for the movies to to watch, you will have like you can filter based on relevancy, based on that embedding, but also look only. Uh, add dramas, for example, or something like that. And again, very simple API, very straightforward, uh, and very easy to start coding. So this is like what we are, this is our main goal, right? <laughs> We're aiming at, again, creating a product where this Mongoose.js and with AstroDB is essentially the way for a JavaScript developer to create an AI application. Familiar API, uh, great integration with ecosystem uh, and great backend with S3DB as well. Scalable database, very durable, and battle tested. A couple of words about the architecture. So, uh, this is basically how it looks like. Again, I, I, I kind of described that already, I guess. So, we have the um, on the client application side, you will have the actual developer code, of course, which connects through Mongoose ODM and this Stargate Mongoose. By the way, Stargate, I didn't mention that. Stargate is like an open source project that we maintain, which essentially implements a set of services that implements all those different APIs on top of Cassandra within AstroDB. So we deploy them in AstroDB. And one of those services is this uh, JSON API, which runs on the server side, and also for that server side API service, we provide this driver that can be integrated into Mongoose ODM. And obviously, JSON API interact, dir interacts directly with AstroDB. And all that can work with open source Cassandra as well, by the way. So if you are an open source user, if you don't want to be in the cloud, that is also a possibility. 
Cassandra is open source, Stargate is open source, Mongoose is obviously open source. So this is just a little bit of sneak peek of what we've done on, on the back end. So I've mentioned before that CQL modeling is like one of the most challenging parts when you work with uh, Cassandra and, uh, and Astra. So when we create a JSON API, we wanted to make sure that the user doesn't have to worry about that at all. And this is how it looks like in Cassandra. So that is like the table that would be created automatically. You don't have to worry about that. This is just to show what we do on the back end to, 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 to implement this. And we call this approach super shredding. So what happens is that we take the document, we kind of shred this into many small pieces, uh, store it in all those different fields in Cassandra. There are also indexes created on top of that. Uh, the value vector, the, the, the field for the vector here as well is separate. It's like the second from the bottom. Uh, that would store your vector embedding if you, if you have one. And by the way, this is optional, of course. If your application only has just like basic CRUD operations, you can do that too. So yeah, here I come to the uh, embarrassing part. Um, <laughs> as I said, like I guess our development environment broke down, I'm not sure, and it's 6 p.m., so there's no one to fix it. So um, what I guess I will do is uh, I will just show a little bit of code. Uh, I've, I've shown some basic examples, that, but that would be like more realistic kind of a thing. Um, this is an application that this is the link to the application, by the way. I think this is the link to, like, to, to, the, to a blog that describes the application, but uh, I'm sure you'll figure that out. So this is an application that um, was created actually by one of our uh, graduates who joined the company like I think a month ago or something like that. This was their first task. Um, and we actually wanted to like to see how easy that was, how easy it would be to to create a somewhat basic but working AI application from scratch using this new API for someone who doesn't who know not, not knows nothing about AstroDB, about Cassandra. He also is not really proficient in JavaScript. I think he did for Java and Python and some other stuff. So that took him like I think a week tops, if not less than that. So let me open a little bit of the code here and uh, show you how it looks like. So the, uh, yeah, the biggest part is under the server. Well, so here we, have, um, here we have some models. So what this application does, and I encourage all of you to run this probably tomorrow when we'll fix this thing. <laughs> uh, and, and see how it actually looks like. But basically this is an application where he, he, he stores a bunch of uh, photographs with their descriptions. And what happens is that we have the photo model, which as you can see has like basic attributes like name, description, and stuff like that. But it also has the vector attribute which stores, in this case, embedding for the description. And there is another model, which is called photo embedding. And this model, it, it is very similar. So we somewhat duplicate the data here. Um, but the difference is that in this particular model, the vector field stores the embedding for the image itself. Right? So we have like, we use two different models. We use OpenAI, I think, for the description embedding and something else, I don't remember which one, for, for this particular thing. So we generate embedding for the image itself uh, here. And uh, if we go to the photo controller file, that would be the file that implements the actual logic of the application. And uh, it basically is limited to like sim several methods. Uh, so search by photo description is the one that would use vector search based on the uh, description embedding. And uh, again, so to, like to demonstrate that we can do both 
pure vector search and hybrid search with regular attributes as well. Um, you can do like you can add category filters, so there are category on the on the on the on the photo, and you can filter by category and search for relevant photos, relevant descriptions within that category, or you can go global just with the vector search. So you can do both. And uh, search by photo is the function where you can actually upload a different image that is not in the database and look for something that is, you know, looks like that and similar to what you just uploaded. So as you can see, like this is, that's not a lot of code. And there is also a lot of code, like a bunch of it is just to generate embeddings and, you know, implement UI on all, all that stuff. The actual logic that implements the, 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 uh, the, the search functionality and this kind of stuff is very straightforward. And also for, for those who are familiar with Mongoose, it's going to be even more straightforward because that's the same API. So, as I said, here's the link. Uh, go through, so he, he actually like describes really well his story about this application, how he ended up creating it. It's a little bit personal as well because he likes photography and that's why he created this. So it's uh, quite an interesting read. And also, you can definitely run it um, and uh, see how it works for yourself. So uh, with that, a couple of more things. Uh, so the JSON API itself, it's not live yet. Uh, it is under, I wouldn't say under development because we're basically complete. And uh, we plan to release that in, in a week, next week. I cannot do a disclaimer, I cannot do like any official pr promises here, but I, I think we're in good shape and it should be live uh, sometime mid next week. So in the meantime, by the way, if there is any interest, uh, interest here, if, if you have any use cases that you think you can use this for, we can also do early access or something, uh, we can discuss that. A couple of links here, the first one is to just register and uh, try the, the vector search and the vector database on Astra. Um, you can do this for free. You can uh, um, do some testing there, do your POC or whatnot. There is a very generous free tier for that. And also the second link is to subscribe to, to, to our YouTube channel, um, developers, developer oriented YouTube channel where we like post some tutorials and these kind of things, um, which might be interesting for you as well. So with that, um, I'll leave the links here, and uh, I can answer any questions if you have any. Thank you, Al. Uh, the code looked very neat. I was very impressed with how uh, hybrid and vector search insertions and retrievals were happening. Um, uh, with SQL, when we use SQL, there's a standard specification. We know the error codes and how to process them. I didn't see any responses for the JSON so I saw the requests, but didn't see the responses of those and how those error modes are happening. Yeah, so like responses in the majority of cases are going to be just JSON documents that you are retrieving from the database. So it's non-standard code then? You have to process them? Or... Yeah, so it's not, like, it's not CQL, it's not SQL. So first of all, CQL is a little bit different from SQL. It's specific to Cassandra. It's somewhat similar, but it's just a different query language which is specific for for Cassandra, something happened. Uh, but anyway, so, but again, like when you when you when you retrieve the documents, you will get your documents in this case. And like this is this is this is a very typical approach for document databases. Um, I mean the error codes. If your insertion fails, yeah. ID. If you cannot find the ID, it cannot yes. update it. Then yeah, you'll get an yeah yeah. There is like a it's uh, yeah probably I, I see I see what you mean. So. It is just a generic HTTP-based protocol. Oh, okay. So what happened is that you send those documents through HTTP, and you get those di documents through HTTP responses. If there is an error, you'll get an HTTP error. Uh, that, uh, that, uh, that's if you use the API directly, right? Which you can do if you are not in JavaScript, or maybe you don't want to use Mongoose for whatever reason. You can do that. Um, but generally speaking, what we encourage our uh, users to do at this point, at least, is to use Mongoose, which abstracts you from all that stuff and simplifies the development. Oh, oh I just saw the uh, another comment in the code. Uh, the intern uses Google Image 
embedding API for images. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Uh, hi. I'm here. That's fine. Oh, uh, we're good. Uh, yeah. Um, what were the AI use cases that people came with to you? I mean, first of all, this is not out yet, so we don't, I mean, this is something that we definitely want to find out. <laughs> and uh, I want to learn about use cases that would be, um, that this would be useful for. But generally speaking, any real-time AI application. So Cassandra already is used for this kind of stuff. Uh, people are building AI applications based on Cassandra, based on AstroDB, and like we have enterprise products as well. Uh, th this project is basically all about developer experience. It, it doesn't really introduce anything new in terms of functionality. What it does, it allows you to start coding in no time, fire up a database, and start building. That's the goal. And second question, how many records with a vector do you support, like how many can be indexed at a time? Do you support yeah. 100,000, a million, 10 million? And uh, what's the underlying engine? Is it, is it kind of Sandra itself or is it some other DB that you're using for yeah. the indexing? Yeah, so the, I'll start with the, end, with the second one. So the underlying engine Cassandra, Cassandra as well, it, itself. Cassandra also has the vector search support. I think it's like in trunk. It's not, you know, it's not in any of the public releases yet. It's going to be in the Cassandra 5, which is going to be out in a couple of months, I believe. I think there is first alpha. Um, that's been out a week ago or something like that. Technically, it's also based on uh, Lucene. The actual, like, vector indexing is based on Lucene. Uh, but that's all part of Cassandra. Um, JSON API itself doesn't reinvent anything in that sense. In terms of limits, there is no like actual technical limit on number of rows. Uh, Cassandra is designed to be very scalable and you know allow for any sizes. I know there are some issues right now that people are looking at. Uh, it's more about, it's more about like performance degrading with the amount of data that you that you add. Uh, but this is something we're looking at, and uh, I'm sure we're gonna overcome those challenges. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, uh, we have one more question here. Thank you very much. I have a question related to the um, kind of a computational resource requirement of uh, SQL search versus uh, vector uh, search. Is it that, that in terms of CPU, memory, are, are they broadly similar or is it very different? Yeah, that's actually a good question. We are doing tests right now on that. <laughs> so generally speaking, um, we expect a little bit of an, of an overhead there, obviously, because it's like a, a layer on top of CQL. Uh, so if you, if you want like best possible performance, probably using CQL directly is a better bet. Uh, but so far, we don't see a significant uh, degradation in performance or significant increase of, of resource usage there. Uh, like what we do see is that you, you I showed this super shredding thing where uh, one of the fields is the actual documents, and then there is a bunch of other stuff, right? So when we read a document, uh, there is some overhead in terms of like how much data we need to actually fetch from the storage physically, right? Um, and also the, the overhead on the storage is there as well. Um, but so far, we actually don't see any like dramatic overhead or degradation there, uh, first of all. And second of all, there are a bunch of optimizations that are lined up for that as well. So general answer, yes. Theoretically, if you want a best possible performance, CQL going to provide that uh, because that's like the direct access. Um, but JSON API is not that, it doesn't provide that much overhead too. All right. Um, so yeah, so thank you so much, Val. Thank and you. Thank you for all the questions from the audience. Uh, before we go into our next talk and the last talk of the event, I want to just announce one thing which I forgot earlier, is that if anyone of you is hiring for any developer positions or any position or looking for a job or looking for a co-founder, for example, now is the time for you to announce. I'll give you mic for like 30 seconds and yeah, anybody looking for a job or hiring for a job role, yeah, there you go. Yeah, hi, my name's JP. Uh, I'm in education. 
And if any of you are interested in the intersection of AI and education and some exciting things that could be built uh, to accelerate learning, please uh, contact me, talk to me, or uh, text me, excuse me, email me, jpg at iteach.world. I'd love to chat with you. Thank you. In the corner. Anybody else? Since I have the mic, I'll go ahead and take the lead that I, do, I am looking for a devrel, developer relations uh, role in machine learning space. If you're hiring, then I'm your girl. Thank you. All right. Like, uh, I have one, one more announcement, and then I will let Shayak take. Hi, everyone. I run a company called Datature. Datatrue is a machine learning operations uh, company based in Singapore and San Francisco. Um, so ex we are expanding operations here. We're actually looking for DevRels and as well as uh, people in the technical product management space. So hook me up, uh, just hit me up on LinkedIn, uh, Kitchen, or just search for Datatrue. You'll see me and then uh, we can chat there. Happy to meet everyone here and thank you. I will find you later. <laughs> All right, next up, we have our last talk of the event uh, by Shayak Sen from True Era, and I will let him uh, take over. Perfect. I'm impressed people stuck around till the third talk. Thank you so much, guys. All right, yeah, so uh, I am CTO and co-founder at Truera. Uh, Truera is an AI observability company that helps you test, debug, and monitor your AI. And, and, and that can be uh, AI 1.0 from four years ago or LLMs. And, and what we are going to talk about today is AI agents that don't destroy the world. And so before we talk about world destructions, let's talk about hallucinations first. And, and, and we'll build up from there. So I'll start off with a bit of a hot take saying that uh, the fact that LLMs are hallucinatory is really a feature and it's not a bug. And it's kind of hallucination is what they've been designed to do. And I'll talk about that in a bit through some examples and, and, and talk about why. So several decades of ML research has really optimized models for generalization and really actively penalize memorization. And, 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 uh, and memorization is when all the bad stuff happens, right? Overfitting and so on. So I'll share some examples of a, about how this overlap can be really murky. So when Claude 2 came out a couple of months ago, I like asking questions about myself to, to see how well it does, right? So, so, so I asked it, asked it about who are the founders of Truera, and it gave me a very coherent, nicely formed answer, and my name was not on it, so I was slightly offended. <laughs> Two, I also found out that my company was acquired four years ago. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and and I didn't know about it. So, so 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 at first I was like, "What is going on? Claude two is 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 the worst." But then this is kind of what it's de designed to do. It's designed to create coherent text in the absence of real information and make up stuff and generate stuff, right? And when you ask the same question about Google, right, the question is. The answer is pretty spot on. It's factually, it's factually correct. Google then get acquired, and, and and all of this makes sense. So, so the reason this is the case is because there is this intersection between memorization and generalization, but it's hard to predict what's in it, how big big it is, and 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 how to really predict that your answer is going to really be. Uh, be factually correct, right? So, just to, just to take a step back, what this means is that that LLMs are really trained to generalize, 
and they sometimes happen to memorize as a side effect. So what that means is that they sometimes happen not to hallucinate as a side effect. So that's what I meant by feature, not a bug. But then what do we do about this, right? So, and LLMs are great for lots of things. And then the goal is to really focus your LLMs on things which are general and things which you can do well. So things like, su like summarization, text embedding, inference, planning, agent behavior. All of those things are things that are general things that don't require memorization. And then you should leave the memorization to something else. So, so this, this is why LLMs need a knowledge source. This is why we have rags. And on the left-hand side, we have vector DBs. On the right-hand side, we have APIs that you can call to act as a knowledge source, right? And 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 then in combining these APIs, vect vector stores linked to the real world, you can build very powerful apps. And and engines are very powerful par uh, paradigm in building these apps. But how do we test agents? today is the key question, which is, and, and the step one is to build an agent, and, and most people I talk to then have the step two, which is hope and pray that it doesn't destroy the world. So, 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 so with this two-step uh, two process, you can't really hope to get very far, right? So, so, so this is why we built this open source project called TrueLens, which helps you track and evaluate your LLM experiments. And essentially, as, as you build your app with one line of code, you can connect it to TrueLens that logs everything that goes under the hood, your API calls, your, your inputs, outputs, human responses, and so on. And then once you have that, and this, this, this is the key piece, which is we have an extensible framework of what we call feedback functions which let you combine everything that you tracked and provide some scores to your uh, app. And, and often these scores are created by LLMs themselves, but you can use a lot of other things. You can use smaller language models. You can create other matching algorithms and so on. And, and once you have your evaluation set up, you can do a lot more test-driven development, if you will, and, 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 and essentially create a leaderboard of your experiments that tell you what does well and so on. And then, and, and when you see things that go wrong, you can also use all the information you track to debug it. So just a small step forward from hopes and prayers. And, and, and yeah, uh, just to kind of capture the things that our users use us for. Uh, they use us for rags, query planning, data agents, streaming apps, and so on. And, and these can be built in either Langchain, Llama Index. You can bring your own framework and Python code. And there's like a bunch of stuff that's out of the box that you can measure. But you can also create your own cu custom Evaluations, because what you likely need is not is is likely specific to your use case. So, so, so feel free to scan this squid, which is really a QR code, and 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 feel free to uh, request a feature, contribute, or give us a start. So, so just to kind of take a step back. There's kind of a spectrum of what we can call AI agents. So, so you have very specific, specialized data in, agents, which are similar to retrieval, and these 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 will have ac access to real-time information. You can have general aid agents, which can have access to more tools and can do more things, and then agents that can take action in the real world. So I'll focus on the first kind for the rest of this talk, but we have a bunch of examples on our 
GitHub that do a lot more things that, that, than what we are just going to see today. So, so what engines can give us in some ways is better than what you can get out, out, out of chat GPT by default, right? Where if I asked about like the best Filipino re uh, restaurant in New York City, you'll get an ans answer that says, oh, the, I, I just know about stuff till 2021, and, 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 and at that point, this is what was going on. Uh, but for all the benefit of how, how well things can go, engines can hallucinate as well. So, so we built an app that just indexes our website uh, and our docs and so on. And, and, and again, I like asking questions about myself, right? So, so I asked who was shy based on what we learned there. And then the, the answer I got was mostly correct, except it embellished my bio a little bit. It, it, it gave me like this nice membership in this inter-government thing that I have no business being on. <laughs> and, 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 and it was really unclear why that happened. So, so in order to test for what's really going on here, we, we developed this thing called a hallucination triad, which essentially takes your query, the retrieved context and the response, and then tries to check for consistency between all three. And, and, the, and, and the interesting thing is that these aren't things which are factual questions. These are just checking for natural language inference questions, which LMS are actually much better in threat than, than ask, asking, hey, is this answer factually correct? So, so, so the first thing I want to answer is, hey, is all the context I retrieved, is this relevant to the question which was asked? Groundedness, which is, is the response actually based on what, what you had in the context? And then relevance of the response to the question. So I'll, I'll, I'll cover some examples of all three and, and, and to see what have happened in the first example. Essentially, once I pass this through uh, TrueLens, I had a view of all the context which was retrieved. And in, in, in this example, it turned out that of the context which was retrieved, and maybe I can just do this in the, in the dashboard itself. And, and let's pray to the demo gods that this works. Uh, right, so, so, so here we had built a bunch of versions of these apps where you can measure how well it's doing on different things and, 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 then, ex and, and then examine the records. And the one which I was trying to debug is who is Shayek, right? And then I have a view of what the inputs were, what the out outputs were. I, I can also see how long and do you think it took. I, I, I can look at the prompts the templates and so on. But the key thing here is that if I evaluate the retrieval piece of this, two parts of the retrieval were actually about somebody else. And two parts of it were actually about me. So what ha happened here is that because there, there, there was a big chunk of incorrect context in there, when the LLM actually created the answer, it mixed up me and Shamik, who also works at Twitter, and actually has an impressive resume, unlike myself, <laughs> and, 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 and puts that in the answer. So, so that gives you a sense of, like for, for the simpler use cases, how something like TrueLens can really help you track and, and, and debug what's going on with your app, right? So, 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 so that just sets a bit of the baseline of what's going on. Uh, you can also have examples where you are answering a question which was in the, in the last, uh, and, and and so on. So, 
returning to what we were ta talking about in the beginning, age agents, right? So, so, so one way of thinking about what agents are shaped as, so you have some kind of a user input, and then you have at the heart, heart of it and reasoning engine that goes in a loop and tries to plan how, how to answer the question or do the task till it's done it using a bunch of API. So, so in some ways, it's like this planning loop that goes on till you're done. So a lot can go wrong here, right? So one, the first thing that could go wrong is that you could choose the wrong tool to answer the thing that, or, or take action in, 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 instead of answering a uh, restaurant thing from Yelp, you might ask uh, Twitter about it and, and, and get a very different answer. Uh, you can get into infinite loops, right, where, where you keep trying to answer the question and, and you just get stuck in a loop where, where you, you don't know if you're getting closer to answering the question or not. Uh, you can also get failed API calls. You can also hallucinate and 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 create answers out 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 of nowhere. So, so 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 that there, there's a lot that can go wrong. And so, uh, in this QR code that leads to a notebook, we walk through a simple ex example of how how to build an agent using Llama index, how to track it with TrueLens, and then how to evaluate it for hallucination and other things. So, so in this example, we'll use the Yelp API to get answers, and there's a few things that we'll set up for checking. And, and what I can do for a bit is to just walk through the notebook itself to, to kind of talk about how easy it is to evaluate this and build it into, into your own app. So uh, so after I've installed a bunch of the things that I need to run this app, uh, I set my uh, credentials, which I'll hide so, so, so that folks don't steal it. And then, and, and, and then the cool thing about Llama Index is that it makes it very easy for you to build an app like this with, with just like a few lines of code. I, I can set up, hey, this is the list of tools I want to use, and this is what they do, and use them for, for, for my app. And to also set a baseline, we'll also create a very simple uh, chat GPT app that, that answers the same question, and to m make it a bit fun, We'll uh, we'll make it act like Gordon Ramsay and 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 be a bit more harsh and critical than it needs to be. Uh, so 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 we we just have a prompt th that does that. And now in this example, we'll walk through one how to set set up custom evals. We'll also check if you ask a question about ratings. Does it actually use the ratings or not? But we'll also use a bunch of the out-of-the-box feedback functions which we have in TrueLens. So, so we'll check if the query tra translation was correct or not. We'll check if the it, so these were the custom ones, and then we'll ask it for context relevance, which is the stuff which was retrieved was was this correct? Uh, you'll also check for groundedness to make sure that the answer wasn't hallucinatory. Answer relevance, which just checks the quality of your answer. I'll also set up some amount of ground truth evals here. So I, I set up some questions and 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 answers that I expect as a secondary eval as well to to make sure that this will work well. So I'll click into the dashboard and, and walk through 
kind of what this looks like. So here we'll see two apps. One is the OpenAI chat completion app. Uh, this is the one just uses that 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 uses chat GPT, and then we'll talk about the Yelp agent. And the Yelp agent one has a lot more evals, as you can see, because there's a lot more things to evaluate, right? And under the hood, you have a bunch of these API calls, which you can check for consistency and so on, and 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 that you can't do as much of that with the straight up uh, chat app. And then once you do that, you can also select what's going on. You can look at the ones which are not doing as well uh, and see what have happened there. For example, in this one, uh, I, I, I see that uh, the answer for the best diner in Toronto is incorrect because the the answer I was expecting was George Street Diner. Uh, so, so these are just the kinds of things that you can do. And so just returning to the app itself, we have like a bit more of an expanded version of the triad, right, where, where you want to ask these questions from your app and 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 you can check that the correct retrieval is happening. And and this is the query translation piece. What Llama Index did under the hood was to uh, take the question of what's the address of Gumbo Social in San Francisco to uh, Yelp query, which, which was an address of Gumbo Social in San Francisco. Thumbs up on that. It, it got that right. You can also check for context relevance, which, when, which is that you got back this response. Is Does that look like an address? You can also check for groundedness, which, which what that does is that once you have a response, it breaks it down sentence by sentence and check if you can trace that to parts of the context which was retrieved or not. And, and, and this is one example where it did okay, where at the end, so, so two of the sentences in the response were correct. The last one was uh, just a piece of opinion, and, uh, and what we didn't find was any supporting evidence which would say, okay, this is part of the context. Uh, cool. So, so, so you can go really deep into the kinds of evals that you can do, but as essentially once you have this workflow of really test-driven development for your app, you can really iterate much faster on testing new prompts, testing new new ideas with your app, while having some consistent way of checking whether you're doing well or not. Uh, cool. So, so. Uh, that was just a quick demo on how to evaluate agents. Like I said, uh, find us in open source. We are just a quick pip installed away. And then one kind of super secret announcement for folks who might be in interested here. We ha haven't announced this yet. We have a hackathon on, on October 7th at the in GI House with uh, Pinecone and Llama Index, and, and and that's going to be a very very different kind of event where half the teams will be breaking apps and half the teams will be testing them. So it should be a really fun and unique event. So it's 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 a true hackathon, if you will. Uh, so DM me on. Twitter or X, if 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 you want to get invited, you'll see the uh, notifications go out in a bit. But that's it. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you, Shayak. Uh, anyone has any questions? I see two hands over there. She will get to you after that. Uh, 
Um, hello, I want to ask how can you do the evidence verification of the, of the results by your hallucination detector? Sorry, I, I missed the key part of your uh, question. How can you do the evidence verification uh, in the process of detecting the hallucination? That's a great question. So, so, so we have a, so in the project, we have two ways of doing this. So one way is we use a, an alarm model that's based on SBIRT with that, that essentially goes in and matches different parts of the context to do the, uh, do the text that you created and, and tries to do the best match between those two to, to see if there's uh, there's evidence for for it or not, and and, and you kind of break break it down uh, sentence by sentence or clause by clause, and then see if there's a matching piece. And 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 the ma matching thing doesn't have to be an exact match, as long as it's a semantic match that gets picked up uh, by by the the S bird and I model which we have the 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 other approach we have is by just prompting an llm as well and that can work surprisingly well uh, we have found that the nli approach is really really strict and kind of uh, only works well on fairly short statements the llm approach can work fairly well on longer uh, text as well. Oh, th th thank you very much. And I also want to ask, can the hallucin hallucination detector be applied on some more analytical tasks, like if I want to locating the location of a pun in a sentence, yeah. can the hallucination detector to detect these kind of tasks? Uh, so, so you're trying to locate the location of a, a of a pun word. Uh, if a sentence has a pun, and and I want uh, my ta and I want my AI to to locate the exact location of the pun word. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so that that's something you could use uh, a feedback function for, and and then uh, plug in into the framework we have. It, it's it's not something we support out out of the box, but you you could define a UDF that could do that pretty easily. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, yeah. I think I might have had a similar question. Yeah, please. In terms of groundedness, by the way, cool presentation. Thank you so um, much. Groundedness, if, if you were to have a user ask a vague question or evaluate a vague response, yeah. I'm curious on if you've thought about that. In terms of, do you just look at the cosine similarity of what's coming back, or how do how do you... Get yeah, yeah. Back. So, so uh, we don't look at the cosines and the idea of what's coming back because that gives you like much worse results than if you were doing some kind of semantic similarity. So, these natural la language inference models are specifically designed to answer implication questions, which is, does statement A imply statement B? Right, so, and 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 they're tuned very well to to answer exactly those questions. So 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 essentially, we run parts of the answer and the context through this NLI engine to check for groundedness, which is, are there parts of the context that imply the the answer? So so that's how you get away from some of the the syntactic stuff that you'll get wrong with something like cosine similarity and and, cool. and you get more of a kind of a inference check. Cool. Um, last part of that question Please, yeah. uh, was if you're planning on any other metrics, because no one really knows what's going on. Benchmarks are kind of lame um, that, that, that we see on Hugging Face and everything. So I'm curious on what other metrics you might be thinking about trying to integrate. Yeah, yeah, so, so I, I think we're, very open, both in terms of the metrics that you can build in, uh, and and also the metrics which we have available, and and so if I go back to this list of metrics, 
kind of way which are cool. available out, out of the box. This is what we have right now, but you can easily extend with your own metrics. And I'll show a different example. Uh, by, by the way, this is our website at truelens.org, and, and you can also join our community or uh, subscribe to our newsletter and so on. Uh, but, but back to kind of the, uh, the question that we, we were discussing, and I, I don't think I have a ta ta tab here. Yeah, so, so in this one, I compared kind of the scores that we produce mm -hmm. with kind of the state of the art NLP metrics like blue or a bird score. And it turns out that this is an app that does really well. But, 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 but like both Blue and Bert are pretty bad at catching that it's doing well. So, so I, it, it's useful to have like a broad spectrum of metrics that you use to make sure you're not like. Yeah, uh, thank you. Cool. Yeah. Uh, you totally answered my question. Yeah. When I said benchmarks are lame, I was thinking more of Hugging Faces leaderboard. Yeah, yeah, um, totally. It's not really too relevant to non-generalized use cases, so thank you, this is cool. Cool, all right, thank you so much. Yeah. Um. Hello. Hey. Yeah, so, hello, I am Anun. Before my question, I just wanted to vouch for True Era because the company I'm working on is in the LLM industry as well, and we are integrating True Lens inside our, yeah, our, what we are trying to build. Yeah. And yeah, they've helped us a lot in our use cases and walking us through making our custom feedback functions as well. So thank you for that. For the question, I know that Langchain released something called Langsmith, which is in the similar industry yeah. about evaluating LLMs and trying to debug. And I just want to understand your insights on what makes True Era different or True Lens different from Langsmith. Great question. Uh, Langsmith is a really cool tool. Uh, it, I, I, I think we see a lot of interest in True Lens uh, compared to Langsmith as one we are own open source to we are very extensible in terms of the kinds of evaluations that you can write. And two, we are not just focused on like Langchain as the orchestration framework. Uh, you could have written your own library to kind of glue together your agent and you can uh, add these instrumentation decorators with like a few lines of code and then also use true lens. So, so uh, I mean, so in, in that sense, Langsmith is fairly restrictive in the sense that it's focused on, on Langchain users and, 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 and it's slightly hard, hard to extend, but for Langchain users, you can get a lot of value out of Langsmith as well. Cool. All right, please. Thank you for the great demo. This is one of the uh, better tools in observability and testing that I've Thank seen. Thank you. Um, uh, you had mentioned an application where you uh, analyze your own website and the bios. Yeah. Is that open source as well? Or? Yeah, yeah. It, 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 there's a, so if I go to kind of uh, our repo, I, and I can pull this up really quickly. Uh, sorry, I need to SSO. Thanks, GitHub. <laughs> uh, Yeah, so this is the the True Lens repo. There's a bunch of examples uh, that are available here with different with different frameworks, different models, and so on. And then TrueBot is the example that we run on our internal Slack uh, that 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 answers questions which we were seeing there. The website as well, the bios. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what so, so, so the, this just creates it from the public website and 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 creates a DB outside of it. But but yeah, there's a bunch of examples here with different frameworks with different vector D, DBs and so on, and 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 would love for you to 
uh, check this example report. Oh, this is great. Thank you for sharing that. And a fun question. You had mentioned you were offended when your name was in mention. <laughs> were you offended when you knew your company was acquired four years ago, or were you happy about being acquired for you. That was hard to take, to, to be honest, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I think my first reaction was being offended, but my second reaction was actually being quite impressed because like a company of in, in our space could have been founded by those people, could have been acquired. So the amount of reasoning that's happening to kind of create something that's plausible that's is pretty impressive. It's just not factually correct, which is what 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 it's not built to do. Awesome. Any uh, there is one more question here. Uh, hi, I'm Brian. I'm a medical doctor and engineer from South Korea. Okay. Uh, and I think thanks for the talk. Sure. I have a question. Uh, if I understood correctly, you're like using LLMs to evaluate LLM results yep. in like a, a, some scoring details. And um, I think there are like inherent limitations to this approach. For sure. So uh, my question is, uh, did you see like any patterns in this approach? Like in what situations does evaluating LLMs with LLMs works fine or like vice versa? Like yeah. in what situation do, do they fall short? That's a great qu question. So, uh, so as long as you're asking inference questions, it does reasonably well. As soon as you start asking it factual que questions, which is, hey, is this answer correct? Or, uh, and so on, you start get, get, getting to, uh, to, to really that murky space of, 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 of the issue. So, so we've had fairly reasonable success with sticking to questions where you ask about, hey, does this imply that? or is this a good translation, and so on. But when it comes to factual questions and so on, things get pretty murky. Yeah. Cool. Ah, so I, how exactly you measure the, measure the, you know, uh, for example, you use a uh, rogue, Score? Yeah. What kind of scores? So, so a rogue score essentially is it's 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 a standard metric which has been around for the last maybe twenty years, maybe fifteen years, that essentially does token matching, which says, okay, if I'm trying to compare two pieces of text, does this token from my reference text exist in my uh, created text or not? So. So that's why I like this rogue metric that we were, or not rogue, rouge, sorry. Uh, the, 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 the rouge me metric actually gets it quite wrong but because often you're not uh, working with exact translations or, or things, things don't match exactly, right? So that's where ha having a language model help you in the, uh, evaluation is quite helpful, which is why this BERT score, which I actually use as a BERT model in between to do the m matching, does quite well. But it's still not perfect. So, uh, yeah, uh, there, there, there's, there's a number of different ways for you to try to measure accuracy, but uh, it's like none of them are exactly perfect. Anyone? There's one more question. Cool. Hey, your talk was interesting, Shai. <laughs> uh, hi. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, what's your uh, experience with the non-determinism in uh, an agent or an LLM? It might it's pass bad, the yeah. test, but when I run it in production, it may make the same hallucination mistakes that yeah. the test said it passed. That's a great question, and that's a great advertisement for our commercial product, which is <laughs> monitoring in production. So, so essentially, uh, two lenses focus on experimentation during development, but you can run the same evaluations at scale when you run something in 
production on an ongoing basis. So, so I, I, ideally, you want to run the same evaluations, not just while you're testing, but also when you're uh, answering real questions in the real world. Yeah, but, but like the non-determinism is real, and then there's also model drift, right? Like the same model changes from month to month, so, so the, the app that worked really well two weeks ago is pretty bad right now. So, so it's, it's, it's just important to do this on an ongoing basis, yeah. Right, thank you. Anyone have any more questions for Shayak? All right. I guess um, I thank you so much, Shayak. Right, that was so a much. great talk.